We're in the midst of a renaissance of the use of psychedelic drugs. Are these drugs just trips, just manifestations of a uh, stimulated brain? Or is there something deeper to it and people are actually managing to tap into a higher reality? Well, my next guest researched that and has a lot to say about it. Join us right now for that topic and more at Beyond Belief. Hi, Dr. Strassman. Um, it's great to have you here. Thank and you. Um, I find this topic to be uh, enormously interesting and something that really seems to be on people's minds these days. And I'm really um, excited to be able to discuss them with you. Um, you are a researcher who is sort of has picked up, it seems to me, like on the on the mantle of what was sort of dropped in the 60s and early 70s. And there, were, there was, of course, at one time, a big interest in psychedelics. I think that became unpopular for a variety of reasons. And it seems to me, based on the popular literature that I'm seeing, is that we're sort of having a bit of a renaissance of um, openness to these kinds of experiences and things that they can teach us and ways that they can help us, so on and so forth. My first question for you is about the word psychedelic itself. You point out in your book that it means mind disclosing, which I thought was a very interesting term and a great term. Um, so apparently it's some kind of key to, to lock, unlock hidden resources, subconscious contents of the mind. Um, what I guess that everyone would, wants to know, including myself, is, is what is being unlocked real or illusory in some fashion? Um, yeah, so the term psychedelic, um, yeah, it can mean either mind manifesting or mind disclosing. Um, and I prefer that term uh, over more constrained uh, you know, definitions or terms like uh, you know, psychotomimetic uh, was a popular term back in the day because of the belief that psychedelics mimicked uh, you know, naturally occurring psychosis. Um, you know, hallucinogenic was the popular medical, uh, you know, medical legal term for many years. Uh, it's a bit constrained as well, though, because, uh, you know, people don't, you know, necessarily uh, uniformly experience, you know, visions or voices. And also it makes you kind of have to consider, you know, what is a hallucination after all? Is it real or is it illusory, as you're alluding to? Um, and also, you know, hallucinogen uh, kind of disparages the effects. It makes them kind of pathological. Um, you know, so, oh, and, um, you know, there's another term, uh, which has become, uh, increasingly, you know, popular, which is entheogen, uh, which, you know, kind of ties into mystico-mimetic. Uh, it conflates the spiritual properties or spiritual characteristics of the state, uh, with naturally occurring spiritual experiences. Uh, so, you know, the location uh, of the visions and the voices if those occur, or, you know, just the feeling of being immersed in an alternate reality. Um, it, 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 um, is that being, uh, you know, generated by the drug? Is it your brain on drugs? Or are you actually, you know, perceiving another level of reality, which you weren't able to before, you know, because of the receiving ability uh, of the brain being altered. Um, and, you know, I don't think you can really tell. Um, I think a um, you know, more generic explanation or understanding is that, uh, you know, psychedelics reveal things which were previously invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, and are, you know, those in your own mind? Are they in the outside, you know, levels of reality or some combination thereof? <clears throat> it's interesting and I guess we'll get more into this um, as we go, but the reason that people use it often is because they want to have some kind of what we call a spiritual experience. And when they do have those, there, there do seem to be certain commonalities to them. You do point out a lot of these in your, in your book, um, the feeling of oneness, of connectedness to the, to the universe or whatever you might describe it as, uh, connection to, to <clears throat> spiritual beings, um, a feeling of love. Um, there do seem to be commonalities, but would you say that, you know, 
why should it be that that you take this mind altering substance and it produces those effects as opposed to any others? Um, I, I knew I do know there's also something called a bad trip. Um, are those just as likely to occur or when people alter their minds, you know, their brains with these substances, are they more likely to have those earlier kind of experiences that I mentioned? Um, well, the ultimate outcome of any experience on psychedelic you know, drugs um, is the drug itself um, and the dose, uh, you know, obviously, you know, but just as important is what is called the set and the setting. You know, the set is, you know, who you are at the time you experience the drug, uh, your mm -hmm. mental state, your physical state, your previous experiences with psychedelics or none. Um, your intention, your hopes and your fears about what you're going to undergo, um, your spiritual you know, practice, uh, are you meditating regularly, uh, you know, do you study scripture? Um, you know, the other important element is what is called a setting, um, which is the environment in which you trip. You know, so that could be indoors or outdoors. Uh, it is also the uh, you know, social and the cultural context uh, and the, uh, you know, people that you're tripping around. Are they friends? Are they foes? Are they strangers? Are they loved ones? Um, you know, what do they expect? Uh, what do they hope for and fear, you know, just like you do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, depending, I mean, you could be, you know, borderline schizophrenic and taking amphetamines and being homeless and being totally stressed out and you take some LSD, for example, and it's a very bad experience. Um, or you could be, you know, somebody that's been, uh, you know, living at a monastery for 15 years, uh, completely steeped in the tradition. Uh, the experiences are placed in the context of the larger tradition. You know, they confirm the tradition's teachings, you know, rather than, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, being the goal of any particular you know, practice, you know, so in, uh, yeah, and, you know, there's other, uh, you know, disciples, your, um, your teachers uh, is there, you know, so that's, uh, uh, you know, quite conducive to a more you know, positive outcome. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this term, which I'd never heard before, which is uh, theoneurology. <clears throat> and um, my understanding is that that is an idea that the brain is the agent through which God communicates with humans, which is fascinating. And I do think, at least from my vantage point, there are certain Kabbalistic teachings, mystical teachings that certainly seem to indicate that that's the case. But I'd like to ask you as, as a scientist, why, why do you assert that? How, how do we know or why would we think that that's the case? Well, you know, my proposing that isn't quite as a scientist. Uh, it's, you know, more <laughs> as a, a, you know, theologian or, you know, somebody that's got a foot in both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the reigning paradigm of the biology of spiritual experiences is what's called neurotheology. Um, and so that proposes, you know, that the brain is uh, the center of it all. You know, that certain things like drugs, meditation, prayer, fasting, sleep deprivation, you know, those kinds of things uh, are stimuli that trigger a brain reflex, mm -hmm. uh, which produces certain changes in consciousness, which are described after the fact as spiritual. Um, you know, some of the qualities you described, uh, the feeling of oneness, ecstasy, out of body travel, um, those kinds of things. Um, and the reason the brain is configured that way is for evolutionary purposes. Um, you might be, uh, if you have those experiences, uh, you, um, you might be more empathic, you're more creative, more compassionate, uh, perceive things more accurately in the outside world. You know, so, um, you know, that is uh, you know, kind of the model of your brain on drugs. Uh, if you trip, it gives you the impression of communicating with God. Um, and um, well, some, um, in my study of Hebrew biblical prophecy, mm -hmm. and especially of Maimonides, 
um, I ended up, you know, turning that model on its head and developed an alternative one, which is called, uh, you know, Theo Neurology, mm-hmm. which is a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach. Yeah, and it proposes, you know, that the brain is configured in uh, you know, such a manner as to be able to provide a channel of communication between humans and God. Um, you know, so it isn't because of an evolutionary advantageous, uh, you know, reasoning, which, you know, proposes this. It's, you know, more of, uh, you know, God, you know, teaching us certain things, you know, some of which you know, may have no evolutionary um, advantage, um, you know, whatsoever, you know, like, you know, for example, you know, mixing of, you know, wool and of linen is prohibited. You know, what's the evolutionary advantage of that? Uh, You know, the red heifer, uh, you know, kosh root, all those things. You know, so it it expands the, you know, the notion of, you know, what is spiritual. It is only spiritual from the perspective of a human-centered point of view, but, you know, more of a God-centered one. Um. Have you seen this uh, TED talk called "My Stroke of Insights" uh, with Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor? I, yeah, I figured. Yeah. Right. Okay, so if, if anyone out there has not seen it, it's one of the most uh, popular TED talks that they have on on uh, on their website. You can go and see it, and it's 18 minutes of uh, what I think is a enormously engaging um, experience that this woman had where she basically lost the function of her left brain and got to, and she's a brain researcher, got to experience the world through the, through the, the right brain only and to, to see what that was actually like. And um, her description of it is, is what I, again, what I would describe as extremely spiritual. In other words, without the filter of the left brain, which is the more analytical, the more mathematical, you know, like controlling the thought patterns, it seemed like that she was free to like to expand so to speak, and encompass much more of the universe. Um, and my question for you is: Could it be from your let's from your scientific or your theological background that the brain is actually the blockage itself? In other words, yes, it it allows us to function and exist in in this plane of reality, let's call it. But really, what it's doing is blocking out most of ultimate reality. Um, you know, allowing us to only navigate within a very narrow band uh, of it. I, is that possible that if Dr. Taylor lost half of her brain and had this totally expansive vision, that so to speak, if we had no brain, <laughs> we would we would be fully immersed in it, not because we'd be dead, which which would be true, um, but but because we would be able to see much more clearly. Any, anything resonate with you in that? Well, yeah. I mean, without a, a brain, we. would be, uh, I mean, who knows what that would be like. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, if you listen, you know, carefully, to, you know, um, you know, to her um, you know, presentation, is especially in the beginning stages of her stroke, it really sounds a lot like a DMT experience. I know things become, you know, pixelated. Um, you know, that was the most, you know, s- striking first, uh, you know, hint you know that I got that perhaps naturally occurring DMT is involved. Um, you know, so uh, you know one of the most interesting things about DMT, which is the compound I, I, I used to study, dimethyltryptamine, uh, is it's produced in um, you know, quite high concentrations in uh, um, the mammalian brain, uh, and concentrations increase in the visual cortex uh, at the time of death in rodents. Um, You know, so the DMT experience is extremely visual. Um, It's out of body, it's quite emotional, uh, it's quite profound. Um, And the, and you know, the fact that concentrations of DMT are comparable to those of serotonin and of dopamine indicates that perhaps there is a DMT neurotransmitter system in the mammalian brain, which you would have to wonder, you know, what is it doing there? Uh, you know, why is the brain making high levels of uh, naturally occurring psychedelic uh, you know, substance? Um, 
you know, so I think that gets to your question about, you know, the filtering mechanism of the brain or the you know, filtering function of the brain. Um, it, it you know, could be, you know, that our everyday consensus reality is the result of a narrow, you know, band of ongoing DMT secretion, which, you know, keep things, you know, which you know, keeps things, you know, within the normal channel, so to speak. Uh, and when concentrations increase, you know, for any number of reasons, you know, things then become, uh, you know, psychedelic, you know, for the lack of a better word. Um, and in conditions where there's low, you know, levels of, of um, you know, DMT, perhaps, you know, this is all, you know, speculative at this point. We don't, you know, know anything other than, you know, the dying brain increasing levels of DMT, you know, but it could be with, you know, low levels of DMT, things are flat, depressed, kind of one-dimensional, you know, so um, I think the whole, uh, you know, question of the, you know, normal function of brain, you know, DMT is, uh, you know, just beginning, uh, you know, to be studied. You know, there's a group in Ann Arbor that's, you know, looking at, you know, levels of DMT in dream, sleep, and rodents. Um, you know, so our, you know, concentrations increase when you're dreaming. Right, right. And it, it strikes me that these are all moments experiences that people have in which um, spiritually minded people would say like the veil is thinner, you know, um, sleep, altered states of consciousness, meditation, prayer, all the things that you mentioned um, sort of thin out that barrier. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering aloud if that's, if that's not what's going on, um, I guess I'm interested in distinguishing between whether it's a chemical illusion, in which case I, I would be largely disappointed, even though I know it might have some clinical benefits, um, versus whether it actually is affording us a window in, in, into something much grander. Um, but that, I guess, remains to be seen. Right. Um, well, you know, the analogy of a you know thinning of the veil is appropriate. Um, you know, you know, but um, you know, what is it a veil? Um, you know, between is it you know between us and a spiritual world, or is it you know, or is it you know between our normal everyday you know consciousness and our unconscious or our subconscious? Uh, you know, so that is you know where the issue of you know peer review becomes important. Yeah. Are you just sure. you know talking to yourself, or are you talking right. to you know somebody else? And, you know, that, you know, ultimately, you know, leads to the notion of, you know, prophecy and, and of, uh, you know, false prophecy. You know, how do you, right. you know, distinguish between the two? Yes. And uh, it seems to me that the answer to that question is is pretty important. You know, uh, how, however you slice it, they both have their implications. But um, let me ask you, you, you were a student of Zen Buddhism, as I understand it, for about 20 years. Uh -huh. Um and but later you concluded that you thought that the dmt research that you were doing was more closely aligned with the prophecies listed in the hebrew bible than than apparently than they do in in buddhist scripture uh, how how did you come to that realization tell me if i'm maybe i'm saying it wrong uh, but but is that correct and how did you come to that conclusion yeah um it's pretty complicated but, you know, um, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, I, you know, started off, uh, you know, studying Zen Buddhism. Um, yeah. um, so I was an undergraduate at, uh, you know, Stanford in uh, the early 70s. And, you know, psychedelics, you know, were everywhere. I um, mean, Buddhism was, you know, just beginning to be studied academically as a result of the monks immolating themselves in Vietnam in protest. You know, right. so the Defense Department uh, started to, you know, fund departments of the Buddhist, you know, studies all around the country, you know, kind of an hmm. ironic twist. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the, you know, freshly minted, you know, PhDs ended up at Stanford. Uh, and I, uh, you know, took her, you know, class on Indian Buddhism, and I was enthralled. It was the closest, you know, thing I had ever, you know, come across that, you know, captured the essence of the psychedelic experience. Uh, so it, you know, strengthened, you know, my belief, you know, that, you know, that there was some intimate relationship, you know, between psychedelic states um, and, uh, you know, Buddhist practice. 
Um, so I spent a couple of years, you know, wandering, uh, you know, through the wastelands of American, uh, you know, Buddhism, and I you know, finally ended up at a Zen temple uh, up in Mount Shasta, California. Um, and I was depressed. I dropped out of medical school. Uh, I was kind of a mess. Uh, and they, you know, saved my life, you know, basically, and I was, you know, extremely indebted. Um, and I became a, you know, uh, you know serious uh, student and uh, you know, practitioner over the next, you know, uh, uh, you know, 20 years or so. So, um, you know, the ultimate goal of you know, Zen Buddhism, you know, not Tibetan Buddhism or uh, uh, you know, Theravada Buddhism, uh, is what's called Kensho, uh, you know, the Satori Enlightenment Experience. And if you read the Heart Sutra, you know, that experience or that state is without form, feeling, consciousness, perception, or volition. Uh, it, it's empty. It's the manifestation of what's called emptiness in Buddhism, shunyata. Uh, you know, so that was my spiritual scaffolding, the platform that I entered my DMT studies with. And mm -hmm. most of my you know, volunteers also you know, shared that point of view because most of them were interested in Eastern religions and were meditating. You know, so um, I expected the uh, uh, you know, pharmacology of you know, DMT, if it was inherently spiritual or was you know, capable of producing spiritual states, would be a Zen Buddhist Kensho enlightenment experience. And it was anything but. Uh, it was, you know, full of content. There were beings, there were visions, there were voices. Uh, there was all kinds of interactions. Uh, the, um, you know, the personality was maintained, even strengthened. Uh, you know, there was the, uh, you know, there was space, there was time, you know, distorted, but still, the, you know, there were space and there were time and, 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 you know, there was time, you know, so it was quite different than the Kensho experience that both I and most of the volunteers expected. So I had to go back to the drawing board for a spiritual model, um, at least from, you know, that perspective, um, which was consistent with the DMT experience and the Buddhist model, or um, at least, you know, the Zen Kensho model was not consistent with my data. Um, at the same time, uh, I was being discouraged from continuing my studies you know, by the Buddhist organization for a number of complicated reasons, you know, most of which were political. Uh, okay. as opposed to, you know, truth oriented, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, that gave me the opportunity to return to studying Judaism. And as I was going, you know, through Tanakh, um, I became impressed with what I ended up calling, uh, you know, prophetic experience, you know, which isn't prophecy as commonly understood as foretelling or predicting, you know, but it encompasses any spiritual experience, uh, um, undergone by any character in the text uh you know the nameless you know soldier that has a veridical dream you know predicting the victory of israel or you know moses on mount sinai is any spiritual experience and in uh you know the guide of the perplex you know um maimonides um articulates you know 10 levels um of you know, prophetic experience you know some of which are just courage inspiration, you know, the ability to teach, you know, so um, with a expanded, you know, definition of the prophetic experience, um, I began to compare the DMT state with the prophetic state. And, you know, phenomenologically, you know, descriptively, the, the visions and the voices, the emotions, the effects on the body um, were quite similar. Okay. So, I, I mean, I, you have a comparison, uh, you know, multi-point comparison in, in the book. And by the way, just mentioning the book, it's called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. I recommend people go and check it out. And this is one of several books you have on this topic. Um, and there does seem to be a great many similarities. I would also say that there's a great many similarities to uh, near-death experience. Um, and a number of uh, weeks ago, I had the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Jeffrey Long um, on that topic. And he was very, when I asked him about this, he was very discouraging about making any kind of comparison between uh, near-death experiences and uh, DMT experiences. In fact, he has writings on his website that, you know, that discourage them. 
And he, he had, he encouraged the listeners to go to a website called Arrowid, um, which, which describes a lot of people's DMT experience. And so I went, you know, I went to the website and some of them do have this, you know, the, the transcendent prophetic sort of qualities that you're talking about, but a lot of them are, I would just say are just weird, you know? Um, and one of them stuck out in, in my mind, like this guy who got himself naked and like, and felt that his mission was to like kill giant spiders roaming around in, in his home, sort of like the, the classic, you know, bad trip stuff that I've heard about, you know, uh, in the past. And he was using that as evidence to say like, look, there, these two experiences are nothing alike. And by the way, I understand that you are comparing, you're comparing prophecy and DMT and not to near, to near that experience. But I wonder if you have any reaction to his discouragement um, and, and any answer to why some of these accounts just seem to be so out, out in left field. Well, you know, there was a study came out of England a few years ago comparing, you know, different drugs effects with reports of the NDE, you know, not in the same individual, you know, but in, you know, different groups of people, you know, those that have used a number of drugs, uh, you know, questionnaire scores, um, and, you know, those that have had a, you know, spontaneous NDE. And of all of the drugs that were compared, you know, DMT um, had the strongest overlap with the naturally occurring NDE. Um, a French study a few months later, you know, did the same thing and, you know, found that ketamine, um, you know, produced the most, you know, similar phenomenology to the NDE. Um, you know, there's a lot of weird, you know, DMT stories out there, uh, but, you know, look at Ezekiel's initiatory vision. I mean, that's pretty weird. <laughs> it uh, is. It is. And I said, actually, the next thing I wrote down, can I, can I read it to you? Uh, sure. But, you know, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, concentrations of DMT increase in visual cortex in the dying rodent brain. Right. You know, so I think up until now or up, up until this point, the, you know, the best candidate for a brain, you know, substance, which you know, mediates at least some characteristics of the NDE is DMT. Right. So we, of, of course he would agree, he disagrees and he has his, his reasons and, his, you know, um, and it's interesting. And I think, again, it's critical to, to, for researchers to try to pin down what's what, you know, and I think that's an ongoing endeavor. And I, when I'm, I'm anxiously watching, you know, how that's all going to come out. But um, Ezekiel, who is a famous biblical prophet, opens up his prophecy with certainly a very um, odd sounding description of whatever he's experiencing. And I just wrote down a snippet of it. It says, a stormy wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with flashing fire and a brilliance surrounding it. And from the fire went forth lightning. Then I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of great waters. Okay, so let's hold that for one second. And um, and and in the book, you also compare, it's actually right at the beginning, page two to three, a person named Leo, who's a DMT user, who, who has something very similar sounding, um, who goes and says, large crystalline prisms appeared, a, a wild display of light shooting off into all directions. My mind was completely full of some sort of sound, like the after effects of a large ringing bell. Out of the raging colossal waterfall of flaming color expanding into my visual field, the roaring silence and an unspeakable joy emerged, welcoming, curious. They almost sang, now do you see? So first of all, I love the way uh, he wrote that. Uh, it's very compelling. And okay, so the, I guess the question on the table is, uh, are we suggesting that Ezekiel had some kind of drug-induced experience? Or is Leo having a spiritual kind of experience in the vein of, of Ezekiel? Um, well, I think there's a couple of key differences between Ezekiel's experiences and those uh, that occurred in the mind of Leo. You know, one is the you know, reason for the elevate. Well, let's see. Well, you. Um, you know, to the extent you know that Ezekiel's visions were DMT-like, 
it supports the belief or the you know the assertion that naturally occurring DMT was mediating those DMT-like effects in Ezekiel's mind at the time. Uh, but the key question is, you know, why were his levels of DMT elevated and mm -hmm. as compared to the levels of DMT in Leo's mind? You know, so the uh, you know, theoneurological approach to spiritual experience is that the bestowal of the prophetic state upon Ezekiel was initiated by God. And mm -hmm. the effect of that communication, that efflux, the downflow, the emanation on Ezekiel's you know, brain, you know, was to elevate levels of DMT, which then were, you know, kind of the, you know, the currency uh, which resulted in the visions and the voices. So the visions and the voices uh, were, though, um, you know, containing divine information, you know, because the stimulus for those brain changes in Ezekiel, uh, you know, came from above. Uh, they, they came from God. They contained a specific message, which was intended to be understood and communicated to the larger community. In the case of Leo, um, it was, you know, uh, elevated uh, you know, levels of DMT from below. Uh, you know, so even though, you know, the imagery uh, resembled, you know, that of, you know, prophecy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the thing which initiated it and, you know, the information as well uh, was a lot more, you know, personal, you know, rather than cosmic, you know, so to speak. Right. And that's interesting. Um, do you, do you find in, in the cases that you survey that there is a prof futuristic prof prophetic state that people go into? Are people making predictions, uh, or furthermore, are they accessing levels of, um, information that they should not be able to in a normative state? Meaning, um, well, for instance, there are the famous mosaic prophecies, uh, the Jews will be exiled off of their land. They will also return back to their land. You know, um, those are, which ostensibly have occurred. Um, and even in the book of Ezekiel, there's a, there's a prophecy of the rebuilding of the third temple that hasn't come to pass, but at least he says it's going to, um, do you, with your patients and your subjects, I guess you would call them, ever hear, I know that this is going to take place and then it does, or I know that across the world, this was happening and this person said this to this person and this happened and, and it, and it really did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The whole issue of, you know, foretelling, um, oh, you know, but one thing before I forget, um, you were, uh, mentioning the importance of, uh, you know, is for example, DMT elevated in, you know, the near death experience. And it, you know, I think you know, it's important to, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, to take the next step in that, you know, thinking, you know, you know, for example, if, you know, DMT is elevated when you die, then mm -hmm. would, you know, that recommend the use of DMT as a dry run for the dying experience? You know, so there are, you know, practical applications for understanding yes. the, you know, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Um, well, the issue of foretelling, predicting, uh, and this conflation with the definition or the term you know, prophecy, um, in a way, is an artifact of the Greek translation of the Hebrew word navi, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for prophet, or, you know, nevuah. Um, you know, the Greeks were interested in altered states as a means of divining or foretelling the future. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, def or, and, you know, so they translated Navi or, uh, you know, Nevua, um with the Greek word prophetes, which means to see ahead. Uh, so uh, it's an artifact. You know, Navi itself means to interpret or to be a spokesperson for. Uh, or mm -hmm. to be an interpreter, a translator, well, you know, not a translator, but an interpreter or a spokesperson. Um, you know, so 
you know, there are a lot of prophetic experiences uh, when you use the term, uh, you know, generically, you know, which do not involve foretelling um, or prediction. Um, you know, like I you mentioned earlier, um, it could be courage, it could be inspiration, um, you know, it could be, uh, you know, the ability to teach. Uh, so, you know, prediction isn't you know, necessary for the definition of prophecy. Um, and the whole, you know, notion of, you know, predictions, you know, there's, you know, short-term predictions, like, you know, Samuel telling, uh, you know, Saul, he's going to, you know, find the lost, you know, livestock, you know, that occurs within the next few hours, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's longer term, the next few months, let's say, uh, or, you know, in the next, uh, you know, few years, you know, there's predictions which occur within the span of a few thousand years, you know, like the exile and the return. And, you know, there's you know, predictions about the end of days, you know, the messianic era. Right. You know, so, uh, you know, predictions are, you know, kind of tricky. I wouldn't, you know, hang my hat on predictions. You know, false prophets can predict as well. But, you know, they would say, you know, let us, uh, uh, you know, serve other gods. And it's you know quite clear. I mean, Deuteronomy, you know, Moses says, if the you know, prediction comes true, you know, but they say, you know, other things than what's in Scripture, one God and the Golden Rule, you know, they're false prophets. You know, so you you could be a you know, true prophet and either you know not predict or your predictions may not come true. You could be a you know false prophet and your predictions come true, you know. So I think that you know the prediction thing is rather complicated. You know, there weren't um, a lot of predictions that occurred in my volunteers. I'm thinking of one person in particular that was accompanied in his DMT state by a, a bee about uh, you know three to four feet tall. You know, that was you know showing him around uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, this, you know, B, uh, you know, showed him these, uh, you know, hive-like apartments uh, where everybody, you know, you know, was living in these you know, hexagonal spaces. And, you know, the B said to my volunteer, you know, this is where your future lies. But as I think about it, you know, that may have you know, been the only specific prediction which uh, emerged in my study. You know, but how do you predict? Um, you know, there's this, you know, notion of Aristotle's, which Maimonides borrowed and expanded on, of, you know, the active intellect, uh, which is, you know, the lowest of the spheres, which is the repository, you know, for information, uh, which uh, occurred in the past, is occurring at the present, and all, po you know, possible outcomes in the future. And when, you know, one experiences, you know, prophecy, you know, depending on the level, you know, one approaches or conflates with or fuses with or, you know, cleaves to the information or the content of the active intellect. And, you know, because, you know, the active intellect um, contains all potential, you know, future outcomes, you know, theoretically, you know, that where, you know, that may be, you know, where the prophet derives that information from about the future could be and that would be fascinating by itself um and it, it it gets my juices sort of up and wanting to like to like to know more about it and um and understand how it happens obviously there's a lot of it, it, in judaic writings about how prophets achieve their prophecy from music to in meditative poses and you know various interesting ways that i think that we know relatively little about and probably would benefit from knowing more about. But I think I have time for one more question. Maybe I'll sneak in two. But uh, Michael Pollan, uh, the, the food writer, uh, has written a book a few years ago called How to Change Your Mind. He also suggests that the new science of psychedelics can help us with fear of death, addiction, depression, and as, as well as achieving transcendence, whatever that means for people. And he profiles an NYU cancer patient named Dinah. And she said, it says about her that she began and end her, I don't know even how to pronounce it, psilocybin? Psilocybin. Um, psilocybin experience as an avowed atheist. During the climax of a journey that extinguished her fear of death, she described being bathed in God's love. And yet she emerged with her atheism intact. How could one hold these warring ideas in the same brain? So I, 
I am just curious your your reaction to that experience. You're bathed in God's love, and still there's no God. What what do you suppose that means? Uh, well, you know the whole you know notion of you know psychedelics, uh, you know. Uh, you know, being intrinsically uh, spiritual, uh, um, and theogenic, uh, they they you know generate you know God from within. Um, I think uh, bespeaks the importance of what we were talking about earlier, which is the you know crucial roles um, of set and of setting, and and your set, your personality, uh, you know who you are, includes you know the unconscious and the subconscious. All because you don't consciously believe in God does not mean that you don't believe in God unconsciously or that you yearn for God, you wish for God, you wish there were a God, you wish you had a relationship with God, and you don't. And as a result, you're an atheist. Um, you know, so, you know, psychedelics are mind manifesting. You know, they amplify what's in your mind, which can also include the unconscious. So I think in the case of an atheist who sees God or feels God or witnesses God under you know, psychedelics, it isn't that you know the drug contains a God or you know generates you know God from within. It's a you know psychedelic experience. You know things which were invisible before are made manifest, are revealed, um, including you know the unconscious. Uh, which in this person's case may have been the wish for or the kind of ambiguous or ambivalent you know, belief in God. Um, her still being an atheist, I mean, I'd have to talk to her myself and you know, see <laughs> right. what she means. <laughs> um, last question. Are you, as a researcher, allowed to experiment on yourself? Well, you know, generally in you know the U.S., that's been discouraged, and I think it was you know because of you know drugs run wild, uh, you know, back in the you know, heyday of you know, psychedelic research. You know, the experimenters and you know the research you know subjects were becoming increasingly uh, you know difficult to distinguish you know from each other. You know, the Europeans uh, you know have always uh, you know said that the scientists you know, must go first. Uh, to establish, uh, you know, safety, to be able to provide informed consent, you know, to uh, you know, prospective volunteers, you know, that's you know just beginning to break into the American, uh, you know, research, uh, uh, you know, scene once again, you know, with MDMA, um, you know, if you're going to be an MDMA, uh, you know, therapist, you need to have experience with MDMA, um, you know, so that's approved now by FDA and it's on on you know, going, you know, set of studies. Um, you know, I've had, you know, plenty of my own psychedelic experiences. <laughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't have spent, you know, two years, you know, battling the government to get permission and funding if I was not convinced that, you know, this was, you know, the gold mine or the, you know, holy grail of, you know, consciousness uh, studies. You know, so, you know, you know, um, but, you know, those experiences occurred uh, outside um, of the research uh, you know, setting. Would, would you be able to, in the two and a half minutes that we have left, could, would you be able to share one insight that you gleaned from having one of those experiences? Uh, well, you know, I've collected, you know, most of my experiences and, you know, hopefully my next, you know, book will be an accounting of those. Um well, you know, to lighten up our discussion a bit, uh, I went, you know, to a party at Scripps College or you know, Pitzer College uh, as an undergraduate, and you know, took mushrooms, and uh, you know, they were serving fried chicken, you know, for dinner, and uh, I could not stop laughing. I was pointing <laughs> at, the, at the fried chicken, and I said, "You're going to eat that? You're going to eat fried chicken?" And I just laughed and laughed and laughed for about an hour. Everybody was, you know, coming in to look at me and say, "What's the matter with Rick? Why is he laughing at the fried chicken?" So, you know, that's a bit of levity, you know, to another, <laughs> uh, you know, profound uh, yeah. discussion. Yeah, I had a lot of friends in college who uh, laughed as you did, um, and there was always something sort of fun about that, you know. But um, I'm I'm glad that what you're doing and other researchers uh, are giving people. Uh, the opportunity to use these chemicals in a way that 
at very least seems to be able to help their lives be better and at, at most maybe is giving them a window into a much higher you know plane of reality and um all that remains to be seen in more detail but thank you so much for taking the time to be here i really enjoyed speaking with you and for the viewers please take a moment to subscribe like and share the content uh, which helps us and um helps you to stay abreast of all the great stuff that we have coming up it's been a real pleasure. Thank you all for being here.